So we have covered five chapters of the Diamond Sutra. We, uh, we're going very slowly, but it's worth going slowly. Uh, the first chapter, of course, is the introduction, or section one. Section one is the introduction. Section two, Subuddhi raised a question, virtuous men and women in the process of developing supreme enlightenment, how should they abide their minds in? How should they control their thoughts? That's a very important question because of that question it raised the whole issue of the Diamond Sutra's main point. So that's the first question raised by Subuddhi. For virtuous men and women in the process of developing enlightenment in the Sanskrit language, is Anutra Samya Sambuddhi. So, in reviewing it, the first section is introduction, the second section is the most important question comes up. For virtuous men and women who practice enlightenment, when they're practicing it, how should they bind their minds in? How should they control their thoughts? And then, of course, the Buddha answered the question. Um, Section 3 is the answer. All bodhisattvas should subdue their minds as follow. In the process of liberating themselves, in the process of leading all sentient beings to nirvana for the extinction of reincarnation, they shouldn't have the concept of liberating sentient beings. Is it paradoxical? No, it's not. We explained that already. Bodhisattvas liberate sentient beings, you know. Bodhisattvas aim at saving others. Of course, saving others would also mean saving himself. So in the process of saving and liberating, uh, forego the concept, the three attachment concept, the, the, uh, the liberator, the ones being liberated, and the act of liberation. So that's very important. It's just the three, the three notions of attachment. The giver, the recipient and the act of giving, or the object of giving. So that's in section three. And section four continue, because talking about liberation is not enough. The, the, the Buddha continued to expound the meaning by extending it to the six parameters. What are the six parameters? Generosity or giving, observing precepts, tolerance, diligence, meditation, and wisdom. So in, in, in practicing the six parameters, of course, the first one is giving, generosity, giving out. Um, then you should give without attachment. And Buddha uh, explains it in detail how. So there's section four. Section five is to coming back is to come is is to come back to attachment again uh, to form. The Buddha asked the question: Subhuti, what do you think? Can the Tathagata be seen by means of his bodily form? So that's the question raised by Buddha, and Buddha explains it by saying: Don't attach to form. Don't attach to matter, or in the temporal terminology. Don't attach to wealth. Don't attach to reputation. Don't attach to authority, power. By overemphasis on, on the pursuit of solely wealth, reputation, power, authority, you lose yourself because you attach to them. And that's briefly what it is all about up to ch chapter 5. Now in chapter 6. Chapter 6, it's the, the, um, the main theme of chapter 6 is to say true faith is rare. It's not 
True faith is rare. What do we mean by that? Let's read uh, the sutra. The venerable Subhuti said to the Buddha, Well, honor one, will there be living beings who, when they hear these teachings, have real faith and confidence in them? That's the question raised. This question means, will there be living beings when they hear these teachings, can develop a true belief in these words, in this paragraph, in these sentences, or in these chapters, expound to them. That means from chapter 2 to chapter uh, 5, uh, because the philosophy, the, the meaning is so abstruse and so subtle, you think, do you think that living beings um, in the future would believe in them? Here, Subhuti was so thoughtful about future followers. He worried that future followers may not believe in such dharma as it is so subtle and, and abstruse. How can they possibly grasp the profound teaching that proclaims that all things are empty of real nature? The Buddha said, all things are empty of real nature, of self-nature, not real nature. All things are empty of self-nature, or all things are empty of ego. Don't attach your ego. We analyze the ego. How can they believe that only by perceiving emptiness of all things that they can realize their real nature? You have to, you, you have, to have insightful perception into things to see through it, to empty it out, to, to see the emptiness, the sunyata of it. It's so true, so difficult to understand. Such a, te such a teaching may be too difficult to accept, much less trying to understand it. Also, the teaching of emptying, even the inside of emptiness, is indeed difficult to believe and to understand. Even the, 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 the perception of emptiness should be empty. So, Subuddhi worry, worry about were so thoughtful about future followers. How would future followers uh, believe in this kind of uh, teaching? So that's what that paragraph is all about. So next paragraph, the Buddha replied to Subhuti, do not speak like this. 500 years after the Tathagata has passed away, there will be those people who will observe the rules of morality and perform good deeds which will result in blessing. These people will be able to develop faith and confidence in these sentences that here is the truth. The Buddha rebuked Subhuti's worry and said there will be surely be beings in the future who observe rules of morality and perform good deeds who will believe in such saying, in this teaching of Sunyata. Now people who observe the rules of morality and who perform good deeds. What are these people called? <coughs> Buddhisattvas. So Buddhisattvas, there will be Buddhisattvas who will accept and believe and will promote this teaching. Arahats may, may go into extinction in the Nirvana because Arahats, uh, once the body is gone, they go into extinction. We call it Nirvana out from life and death. But Buddhist sattvas, they always like to stay behind. They always like to stay behind to help out. That's why Buddhist sattva, Siddhagapa Buddhist sattva says, I wouldn't go into nirvana if there is one individual suffering in hell. I would, I would wait until that, that individual is liberated. So, Buddhisattvas always stay in this world. So, how can people, uh, how can there be people who don't understand it? Because Buddhisattvas understand teaching, teaching, this kind of teaching. And if they stay behind in this world, they would promote it. So, that's the definition of a Buddhisattvas. So, there will be people, there will be beings who observe the rules of morality. Uh, who will do good deeds, who will have blessings, these are Buddhisattvas, they would believe in it. Arahats enter into nirvana 
and leave the world, but Bodhisattvas vow to remain indefinitely in the world to liberate sentient beings. They will always stay for the liberation of all sentient beings. Time and space are not constraints for the Bodhisattvas. Uh, their body may be gone, but they always come back in different forms. What do we call that? Remember the three bodies? Three bodies always come in different form. Nirmana, Nirmanakaya. Bodies of transformation. Remember the three bodies? Dhammakaya, or the Dhamma body, Sambhogakaya, reward body, and Nimanyakaya, bodies of transformations. They come back in different forms. Bodhisattvas always stay, they appear in different forms to help liberation, to help to lead sentient beings to nirvana for the extinction of reincarnation. Nirva extinction of reincarnation is another word for nirvana. When you go into nirvana, no more reincarnation, no more life and death. We are in life and death, you know. You, we, are always like we go through life and death. After this body is gone, you're, you're holding this body now. You're John, you're Jack, you're Janet, you're Joan. You're holding this body, but when the time is due, you got to leave this body. You're dead. We are dead. You change another form. We call that reincarnation. You change another form. You go into the next life. So the death of this life does not mean it's the end of it. You go into the next life. Who determines you go into the next life, first time commerce? Who determines who? Who determines the, where you're going? What determines? What determines? What determines it? You're not God. Not God. You yourself. Would you reincarnate into uh, the animal realm? Or would you go to hell? Or would you become guardian angels? Where would you go? It depends on what you have done now. If you always commit crime, if you always hurt other people, if you are creating bad karma, you steal, you kill, you lie, you commit sexual misconduct, you do all kinds of unvirtuous things, you carry that karma with you, you go into the next life. What kind of life? Vicious rams. So that's the reason why we are different. Who is responsible for it? Say, if there's people, some people were born into rich families, some people are handsome, some people are ugly, some people are tall and short, healthy and healthy. Why these differences? Is it God who gives you all this? You yourself, we, we, we are responsible for your, our, our actions, our karma. That's why you have to purify yourself. Purify your action, purify your speech, purify your mind. The Buddha said, you are responsible, not any other. Is it fair? Of course. Because that's what you have done in the past. Cause and effect. You cultivate this cause, you have this effect. So life is not just one, one distinct unit of measurement. Presence, no more future, no more past, no. It's a cycle of reincarnation. But that's just, just no, I, I'm, I'm digressing from what I'm talking about. Just a few words for newcomers. Because otherwise you don't know what is reincarnation. That's reincarnation, you're changing your form. The essence does not change. But the form changed. You believe in it, you don't believe in it. Well, this is something to arouse your interest in. Um, think about it deeper. Why do we come to this world? Why do we get born in here? Why are we all different? 
what account for our future? Can I be a better individual? Can I be happier? How to be happier? What's the objective of Buddhism? Yeah, what's the objective of Buddhism? What is the objective of studying the Buddha's teaching? To get blessings from Buddha? No. That's not the objective. If, 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 you, if you study Buddhism just to, to receive, it's a selfish, egoistic, egoistic motive because you just want to receive. I want to get blessings from Buddha. You're practicing egoistic behavior. The objective of Buddhism is in twofold. The present and the future. The present, the present perspective, objective, in this life, how do we do it? What, why do we study the Buddhist teaching? We study the Buddhist teaching because we want to liberate ourselves and others from suffering, from mental defilements. We help others and help ourselves to liberate ourselves and others from suffering. What kind of suffering? You've got to study, analyze suffering. The Four Noble Truths. And after you're liberating yourself from suffering, you purify your behavior, your speech, your thought, and you help others to cultivate. To cultivate peace of mind. Only by cultivating peace of mind would you be able to get happiness. Happiness is in the mind, not in material, not in wealth, not in power, not in reputation. It's in the mind. That's the present perspective. How about a future perspective? After this life, go for extinction of reincarnation. No more life and death anymore. Have you, have you suffered enough or not enough in this life? You have to go through death, sickness, grief, sorrow, anxiety, disappointment, jealousy, hatred, all these mental defilements. Have you got them enough? Have you got these things enough or not enough? If you say, I haven't got enough worries, I haven't got enough anxiety and disappointment, go ahead, you do more bad things, you'll get more. So this is just a digression. Get back to you. Get back to the main chapter. So, the Buddha said after the 500 years after, the Buddha said, uh, because Subhuti raised the question, would, Buddhist, would people in the future believe in this kind of abstruse and subtle teaching? The Buddha said, uh, don't worry about it. After I passed away, after 500 years, there still be bodhisattvas who understand and promote it. Um, why did the Buddha mention within 500 years? What is the significance of this time frame? Why 500 years? Why not 400 years, 800 years? Uh, here we have to understand the prediction of the Buddha on the rise and fall of his teaching. Because everything has a cycle. It rises, it, it gives rise to it, it sustains, maintains, it changes, and disintegrate. Because this, everything is subject to life and death. Even the, the, the weather, even in, in every year, there's spring, autumn, winter, and summer. It, it's, it, it's always, nothing is not subject to life and death and the cyclical changes. Um, nothing is not changes, changing, everything is changing. Nothing stays permanent. The weather, molecules, protons, electrons, your body, your human life is life and death. Your baby and you're born, you become an adult and you become a senior and after senior, after so many, so many years, then everybody has to die. Everybody, everybody goes through a cycle. Everything goes through a cycle like that. From arising to sustaining to disintegration. Even the Buddha's teaching. If the Buddha said everything is going to a cycle except my teaching, but that's, that is not logical at all. Everything, if everything is going through a cycle, including the Buddha's teaching, has to go through a cycle. 
So the Buddha already predicted the rise and fall of the Buddha's teaching. And the Dharma has a cycle of three epics. The epics of arising, the epics of maintaining, the epic of perishing. So the Buddha's teaching arising 2,600 years ago, and then maintaining for a little while, and then it's perishing. And it's in three epics, of three periods, of course, long period. Let's talk about these th three periods, because we want to know how come the Buddha mentioned 500 years. Every word is important in here, you know. The Buddha didn't say anything without meaning. So, what is the first period? The first period is the actual Dharma epic. Lasts for how many years? For 1,000 years. And that starts from when the Buddha became the Buddha. In the Chinese language, it's Zheng Fa Xi Qi. For 1,000 years. So, the first 500 years, after the Buddha passed away, the first 500 years, during the first 500 years, it's from about 550 BC to 50 BC. In this period, there were quite a few of people who practiced and become liberated and went into nirvana and became successful. In other words, people become arahats much easier than people now during the actual Dharma epic, especially the first 500 years. Now, in our time, very extremely few people become arahats. But in that time, 500 years after the Buddha passed away, many people practicing for one life, they became arahats. They went into nirvana, extinction of reincarnation. That's for the first 500 years. That's about 550 BC to 50 BC. The second 500 years, not many people became successful achieving liberation. But a lot of people had a lot of strength in meditation. In other words, they have concentration in their practice, especially meditation. But not as many people became successful in nirvana and enlightenment as the first 500 years. But of course, there's still people who became successful in one lifetime to become the arahats because they practice meditation. A lot of meditators, they were so strong in the meditation, they were so concentrating in the meditation that they can easily get nirvana. But not as good as the first 500 years. Okay, the first period, the actual Dharma epic for 1,000 years classified into the first 500 and the second 500. Resembling is likened to the first period. Quite similar, resembling means similar, quite similar but not close yet, not close but quite similar. We call it the resembling Dharma period. Xiangfa. Also 1,000 years. In other words, the second 1,000 years. And the second 1,000 years further classified into the first 500 and the second 500. The first 500 followers practice through listening and reading rather than actual meditation now because they didn't have the strength, they didn't have the concentration. They just followed the practice by reading and by listening. So from 450 AD to 950 AD, people didn't get nirvana. Not very many people get nirvana from meditation. They, they just spend their time in listening and reading. So a lot of books, a lot of canons, a lot of lecturers, but just listening. But in the first 500, remember, of the first period, people just practiced and be, they became arahats so easily. But in this period, the resembling Dharma period of 1,000 years, first 500 years, listening and reading. The second 500 years, which lasts from 950 AD to 1450, followers were mostly interested in building temples. A lot of temples, but very few practitioners. A lot of temples. Fantastic, wonderful temples, because more and more they, they emphasize on material, on the grandeurs of buildings. There's the Dharma ending epic for 10,000 years. The Dharma is slowly disintegrating. It classifies into the first 500, 
there is a lot of discontent and differences in practice. And that's from 1450 to 1950. During this period, a lot of arguments. This practice is not right, that is not right. You have more arguments than practice. There's the Dharma ending epic for 10,000 years. And then the remaining years is what we are in now. It starts from 1950. It starts from 1950, and as time goes on, the Buddhist teaching is slowly disappearing. So we just started the Dharma ending epic. So there will be no more Buddhism as time goes on. People will be fighting, there will be wars, and people kill each other. No more Buddhism. No more, no more Buddhist teaching. It disintegrating. So in that chapter, it says, within the 500 years, it's the first 500 years of the, of the actual Dharma epic. There's still, of course, a lot of Buddhist satwas. So, you know, the Buddhist teaching is slowly disintegrating. We are right now in the Dharma ending, ending age. And it lasts for 10,000 years. So altogether, 12,000 years. There's 12,000 years, approximately, of course, for Sakamuni Buddha's teaching. 12,000 years. And we are now in the ending age. First 1,000, second 1,000, now it's 10,000. Um, But, although we are in the Dharma ending epic, we know that Buddhism will not die low until it, it, nothing remains. Because, you know why? Because there are vows of Buddhist Sattvas who vow to come back. So, you, you, do you see the greatness of Buddhist Sattvas? The Arahats already entered into the extinction. They already liberated themselves. No more life and death for themselves. But the Buddhist Sattvas always are thoughtful and want to come back. They're always Buddhist Sattvas coming back to, to liberate people, liberate sentient beings. So we still have hope. Even though we're in the Dharma ending epic, there are still Buddhist Sattvas who appear in different forms to help out. Okay, so I haven't really, uh, I have to stop at this point. I just have finished the second paragraph of section six. And um, I pointed out to you the time frame of the Buddhist teaching. That's, be that's because the Buddha said, do not speak like this. After 500, uh, 500 years after the, the Buddha has passed away, there will be people. Uh, there's a time frame for, for the Buddhist teaching to last to maintain and to, and to perish, just like anything else. So even the Dharma is, you know, perishing. So, so what do you attach to? If you, if you attach to the Dharma, even the Dharma itself is disintegrating. Any question? We haven't finished sec section six, so you see, uh, if we want to deal with it uh, point by point, it takes a long time, yes? Um, uh, three periods, last 500 years. Of course, during the Buddhist period, a lot of practitioners became arahats because the, personally, the Buddha taught, taught them. Eh? And after the, the Buddha passed away, the teaching is so fresh, still fresh. There's a lot of arahats still left behind. It's just, it's just the same as when the Buddha was, was present with them. So a lot of people will have personal contact with arahats, personal contact with, with saints. So naturally, if you have personal contact with saints, a lot of people become saints too. That's the reason. Any more question? Yes? When is the next uh, the Buddha will be rebirth? The, the next Buddha will be the Buddha of happiness, Maitreya Buddha. Maitreya Buddha will be the next Buddha coming back, coming to this world after Buddhism is gone and, uh, and, 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 and the next Buddha in the future, the future Buddha will be Maitreya Buddha. Yeah? Okay? Any questions? Yes? About the Dharma, is it 
Dharma is equal to the nature, uh, the law of nature. Mm -hmm. So it still maintain after uh, the, the law of nature will, will of course be understood by uh, the people after ten over thousand years or later, right? The law of nature is always the law of nature. The law of nature it's always the law. It's always there. Is this air? When, when, when we're all gone, the air is still air. Space is still space, right? But here, the meaning of Dharma means the Buddha's teaching also. You understand? Dharma has, is a very broad term. Dharma means the law of nature. It means everything, and it also means particularly the Buddha's teaching too. The Buddha's teaching disintegrate, no more. But the law of nature is still there. It's just like when our body is gone, when we are dead, you think the space, there's no more space? We are dead, but there's still air, there's still space. The space is still left behind, but we're not there anymore. We, we come back, though, in another form. You are Mr. Chung now. You become, come back as Mr. Wong. <laughs> we don't know. Based on your Dharma, a karma. Yeah, any question? Yes? Of course, if everything is gone, uh, uh, if everything dies, so there's no point in, 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 in doing enlightenment, is that what you mean? Well, you die only this life though. You, only, you, do you, you believe that when you die, you, you disappear, no more you? No, there's still a you. That is, if we can, uh, there is still a you in you that reincarnates into other form. But there's still a you, you know. It does not mean that you disappeared. You just changed another form. So you still care about yourself, right? Yes? It seems that at this period of history, there is more interest in Buddhism. So it seems that this period... There's more, there's more interest right now in Buddhism. Yeah. And it seems to be building rather than diminishing. Yeah. We're talking about a general trend. It's, it's, it's building up momentum in, in, in North America. It may be diminishing momentum in, in, in other parts of the world. We're talking about a general trend. Because within, it's just like when you're plotting a curve. The curve is going up, generally. But during the going up, there is always boom, 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 boom. Rise, fall. It's like the stock market. You know, the stock market 100, uh, 50 years ago is this point. After 50 years is here, it's going up. But it, in the going up, there's down, up, down, up, down, up. It's just the same thing. Specifically, in this period, in North America, it's going up. Because we know that the fastest, one of the fastest growing religion in North America is, Buddha, is the Buddhist teaching. It's going up. See? And, and also, the sutra says, the lifespan of sentient being is diminishing. But how come we are living long? But people, most people reach up to the age of 80 or 90. Well, that is within the curve. Some people may experience, you know, this particular period, people live longer. Another particular period, it may be shorter. But the trend is that, yes, the trend is that people's lifespan is diminishing. That is, the, that is the general trend and the specific trend. Yes. You understand that? Okay. Any more question? Yes? Actually, in America, like now, they predict that this generation will live shorter than the, the parents. Uh, in the future? Yeah. Uh, this generation so will live short? This, this new gen generation yeah. will have shorter life because the, of the quality of food. Could be because uh, sometimes we, we cannot just identify this by looking at one particular region or one particular period of time. Um, and also, uh, in our present age, wars is not in the form of, of personal combat. Uh, in the old days, you're holding a gun and I'm holding a gun and you have to come close, closely to each other. You strike me and I strike you, then we're dead. But now, one button could kill a, a million people. So if you, if, you, if you, arithmetically, if you work out averages, maybe our average life is just about a few years. Some people, you know, 
a lot of people die because of one bomb, you know, or a chemical, uh, a chemical uh, weapon or anything like that, atomic weapon, and, and, and they kill each other so easily now. Somebody put something, something in water in the reservoir, the whole, the whole city will be gone. A plane hits a building, then uh, thousands of people get killed. 